Okay, good evening, and thank you for attending tonight's session of the Kaiser Music Series. This is session number seven, entitled Being a Music Major, a discussion of what it is like to be a music major in college. Tonight's panel consists of Stephen Mayu Adler from the Frost School of Music in Florida, Christina Maytay, a recent graduate from the Mason Gross School of the Arts in New Jersey, and Louis Fowler from University of Colorado Boulder. Um, if we could just kind of go around the room, uh, once we get everybody unmuted and ready to go. If we could start with Stephen, just tell us a little bit about your background um, and your college experience. Of course. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Stephen Mayu Adler. I'm currently a senior studying music education at the Frost School of Music in university, at the University of Miami. Um, I'm a classical percussionist. However, I'm also well-versed in the marching arts. Um, I have done Strike and Carolina Crown, uh, Frost Band of the Hour, everything, high school, middle school, everything. Um, and uh, I've taught a few high schools uh, for marching band and I'm really excited to graduate in the next year and, and get out there and teach. Christina? Hi, everybody. My name is Christina Mate. I actually just graduated last month from Mason Gross at Rutgers University. I did my major in music education as well, and I studied clarinet. So I actually had the very interesting experience of student teaching during this uh, period of social distancing, which then turned to online learning. So I was actually able to do a lot of virtual teaching, which was pretty challenging, but it was also a really good opportunity to be able to craft online um, resources for the students to use. I have a computer science minor, so I was able to make programs for the kids. So it was really cool to be able to combine those two disciplines. Um, I'm gonna be working in technology post-graduation, but then I'm going to veer back towards music in the very near future for grad school. And last up, Lewis. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Lewis Fowler. Uh, I'm a current graduate student at uh, CU Boulder, uh, also pursuing uh, my licensure as well. So that's sort of a unique experience. So I'm in all the graduate coursework I would need to get my master's degree, but also um, taking the undergraduate coursework that I need to get licensed in the state of Colorado. Um, I got my undergraduate degree at the New School in New York City, uh, my primary instrument of saxophone. And uh, yeah, I just finished my first year at CU Boulder. It's a three year degree, so I got two more to go. Um, I'm hoping that we can go off Zoom soon because uh, Finishing my practicum and all that was a little bit difficult, as uh, Christina was saying, but it's a, it's a unique challenge, and uh, I've enjoyed, just to a certain extent, trying to overcome those challenges. But uh, yeah, that's my background. Excellent, excellent. Uh, just to the attendees on Zoom and on Facebook, feel free to post a question, um, and if we if there is time, we'll be able to ask it. Uh, we had a couple people submit some questions. Uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, so we're gonna kind of go through the line and see what these panelists think uh, and how it relates to their, their own music education experience. So let's go in kind of reverse order. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Lewis. What made you wanna pursue music in college? Um, so music has just always been a big part of my life ever since I can remember. So. When I was in high school trying to figure out what I wanted to do, that was sort of a clear direction for me. I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do within music or what I what career I wanted to end up down the line, but I kind of had a gut feeling that I really wanted to do something that involved music. So that was sort of the jumping off point for me. So I started out, as I said earlier, getting a performance degree uh, in saxophone, uh, specifically in jazz, jazz studies. And um, maybe during my junior year, I um, sort of found this newfound passion for education. And that, that was through a bunch of different um, opportunities that I had uh, the privilege to participate in during my undergraduate degree. 
So that's why I'm here at CU now and um, getting my licensure plus my master's because I didn't get the opportunity to um, get licensed during my undergraduate. So sort of my winding journey to where I am now, but it all started with just um, a passion for music. Um, that's all it took. Fantastic. Uh, who's next? Is it Christina? Yeah. So I think that I had a pretty similar experience to Lewis. Um, by the time I was like a freshman in high school, I was debating about what I would study in college. And at the time, I was reevaluating whether I was seriously interested in music just because I didn't have, in some ways, the best teacher to kind of pull that inspiration out of me. But uh, I saw a couple of the older kids who were really talented, and I think they were at the time about to graduate and go on to study music. So I saw what music could be if pursued at a higher level. So I thought that was really cool. And that was basically what prompted me to get back into studying privately. And then from there, I really started to more seriously enjoy my instrument. And then I figured, yeah, this is the way to go. And last but not least, Steve. Um, yeah, mine's a little different. Um, I like both of you, I did feel the whole, like, I'm doing music, that's great. I could keep doing music kind of kind of deal. But um, I really noticed that I, I liked I liked the feeling I got when I was helping the younger percussionists or the younger musicians and like teaching the drum line or teaching the class, um, giving, giving like little lessons to, to the elementary kids who needed help. I really, I really like the teaching aspect of it. Um, and I kind of, I started feeling more of a passion towards education. Um, and I decided to use music because I love music and I, I think it's, it's a place where students are vulnerable and it's a it's a place where students find uh, a family if you build the right culture and it's it's uh, somewhere I could make a, a big impact you know um, with how the world is right now I wanted to I, I recognize that teachers are the ones who can really make a big impact on a student's life positive or negative and um, I've had quite a bit of both and um, especially in music. And I wanted to be that positive influence for a student and change someone's life for the better. Uh, and music was just the best vehicle to do so with. Excellent, so let's go on to our next question. And I've kind of made it a gallery view for everybody. Um, so whoever feels most inspired to answer this question, uh, and some of it was answered in that first question, but what does pursuing a music degree mean to you? I can go. So I think that has actually evolved as I've gone through college. So I really loved Steven's response. I think that uh, the feeling of impact really became enlarged when I was actually with kids doing my student teaching this semester and last semester as well just to see how much they can sincerely enjoy being around you. If you create a positive environment, it's really cool. Uh, at the same time, I've also thought a lot about what I might want to do with music going forward. And some of that is combining disciplines with music. So I see a lot of potential to use music as a vehicle for impacting other fields as well. At the moment, I have a really strong interest in science and music and how it might be able to branch into medicine and kind of still going along the avenue of education as well. But I feel like now having graduated, I have a more holistic view of all the different things that music can be. Sort of echoing what Stephen was saying earlier, just um, through my own experiences with teachers, good and bad, it's sort of, uh, once education sort of became, though, came clear as the route I wanted to pursue, um, those experiences with teachers sort of shaped my view of how I wanted to be as a teacher. And um, especially those positive experiences really inspired me um, just to work with kids and to pursue education as like a full career. 
And uh, the experiences with bad teachers are just as important because it's really made clear to me what I don't want to be as a teacher. So I think those experiences are just as valuable, sort of outlining um, the change that we want to be when we sort of enter the workforce. And I think that change is really going to come from this next generation of music educators. I think you both said a lot of good stuff. <laughs> um, I guess I, I guess the most important thing I I just heard was was Christina's first comment about how it's changed uh, from you know when you got in. Um, for me, I was so focused on like yeah, I'm going to be a band director or maybe a choral director or whatever, um, and then I started noticing what I could do just right away for either you know students I was I was student teaching with or doing a marching band job with or um, honestly my friends you know I, at my university I'm president of the NAFME chapter and I've I've just I have felt rather than music ed being something I want to do it's become a responsibility for me I feel that like I have I have a responsibility to be there to help others and um, be there to help change the world right now. Very good. Uh, so we actually have our first question from the live audience. Um, what was your most challenging task when you decided to be a music major, music educator? Specifically music ed or just music in general? Uh, this question is, I guess, speared more towards the music educator. Uh, for me, it was working with special learners. Um, I was thrown in last year to a percussion section of eight, and between them, I had uh, 15 different special learners categories. <laughs> um, I had a few ESOL, plenty of ADHD, um, oppositional defiance disorder, autism, like everything. I, honestly, it, it was my whole special learners class in one, but I hadn't had any training yet. So um, for me, it was, it was being able to not just like regurgitate how I've been taught, but really try and find out what works for my students and what, how others learn, you know, Anybody else? Yeah, so for me, uh, perhaps more generally, it was really getting my hands wet or dirty or whatever <laughs> in classroom management. It was honestly so hard in the beginning because you kind of have to force yourself to really be in charge in a way that, well, personally speaking, I had never really felt like that before, where I can step in front of 20, 25 kids and really feel like, and that's not even, you know, a band setting. This was just general music that I did for um, my full semester of student teaching. So it was still really intimidating. And I'm not necessarily the type of person who feels very confident in front of large groups. So it was learning how to be stern without necessarily losing control so while I might have sort of turned inwards, if I get a little bit stressed out, sometimes you really have to put your foot down and tell the kids what to do because they need that structure and learning how to navigate that and then putting my own feelings of insecurity aside, it was tough. And I would say that I still didn't really get through it, especially because we had to leave and be virtual for like the rest of the semester. So that is still a learning process for me. Yeah, along those same lines, uh, just sort of balancing your role, because I feel like I'm, being a music teacher is a really unique position to be in, just compared to other teaching roles, just in the way that you interact with the kids and the activities that you participate in and sort of the time you spend with the kids. So just sort of, sort of balancing the role of teacher and also, I don't want to say friend because I don't think you should ever really think of yourself as your kid's friend per se, but more as like maybe a confidant 
or someone that they can trust, someone that they can go to if they're feeling uncomfortable. Um, so it's just sort of along the same lines, sort of fostering a classroom environment where you can get things done, but also an environment where your kids feel safe and uh, an environment in which they feel that they can share their opinions without being judged. So sort of walk in that line. Excellent, excellent. Um, so kind of the last in the, the preliminary category, what is the most rewarding or enjoyable aspect of being a music major? Uh, I'll start off with this. Um, I mean, it's sort of echoing everything that we've been saying so far, just being able to really spend time with kids and feel like you have a positive impact on their life. It's just like the most rewarding thing ever. And um, I uh, sort of found that's really what, what inspired me to become an educator versus a performer is just the feeling I get when I'm when I'm interacting with kids and uh, creating positive musical experiences with the kids. So that's really the most rewarding thing for me. Yeah, I, I same. Um, it the any moment you get that you see the impact you've had on a student, where where you're reminded of it. Because I I know I don't know if you guys feel this way as well, but for me and other people I've talked to, when you stop teaching for a while and it's just like how hard music ed is, you you start doubting yourself. Um, you start doubting, you know, are you going to be good at this? Is this, is this worth all the work? Um, and then for me, whenever I'd have like a student who was, who was doing really rough with behavior the week before, and then just said like, Hey, I listened to your advice and I did like, I did much better in class this week. Or, um, I was at a clinic right out of high school. I was interning at a clinic and after getting all the signed artists autographs some girl came and asked for my autograph because i i meant more to her than just some random intern um or when a parent will say like thank god for like being the best thing in my son's life because you convinced him not to quit band like th those are the moments there that are just the most rewarding like i don't yeah, listening to like a good scale might be good because you know you you help them with music, but like really, the best things I've ever felt with everything I'm doing is the teaching aspect and not not at all the music aspect. I definitely agree with all of those things. We're actually going to throw something in there that's not teaching related. Um, because I have some really fond memories related to performing, because I do think that in a similar way, we can really create a positive impact through performance as well, through you know making music and making people happy. And I have some really fond memories of my friend and I just performing for people, and we kind of feed off of each other's positive energies, and it creates this really fun atmosphere. Um, and in that regard, I would say that I always enjoyed performing more when I was with her because there was just this feeling of we're doing something together. And I think that same feeling happens in the classroom as well. So all those things are really good. Okay, now into uh, kind of like the daily life of a music major. Uh, so all of us come from like different schools and different schedules and different lives just kind of give a brief synopsis of a typical day in your music major life. I guess I could, I could start since I don't see mute buttons turning off. Um, our Dean of Students likes to do this thing before every year uh, to remind all the freshmen of what it's like to be a music major. So I, I without the visual aid, I'll, I'll do the same. Um, for us, when you have 18 credits, um, which is almost every semester, <laughs> um, you know, for a bio major, um, that's, that's six classes, right? And, and that's, you know, 18 hours a week plus about 18 hours of homework. Um, 
for us, those 18 credits, instead of six classes, it becomes 12 classes. Um, if you're counting ensembles, lessons, um, not counting the practice that you have to do, which oftentimes as music ed majors, we don't actually have time for. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, so if you're, if you're doing um, six classes, three ensembles at lessons, that's 18 hours, 18 credits, but it's, it's also, you know, double what everyone else is doing. So a typical day would honestly be from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. class straight with a half hour break and 15 minutes between each class. And at three o'clock, uh, you know, you have marching band and then you do marching band until seven o'clock and then seven o'clock is homework time. And, you know, that's, that's honestly what my typical days have been for, uh, for three years now. Um, and then, you know, at eight o'clock after your homework, you have a meeting, a club meeting. Um, so they're busy. They're really busy. But I think for me, finding time to myself has been very important and finding time, like those 15 minutes between class need to be spent with friends or yourself like not be done, uh, not, not be spent with homework. Um, I found with Zoom, all of, all of my friends and I are missing those 15 minutes between classes that we would all talk to each other and get to know each other and see how everyone's doing, do the mental check-ins. Um, and that, that was really the social time. That was the break between each class in a, in a six hour block, you know? Yes totally busy um those credits seriously they do not translate the same way um really you might have like so many small classes and then they actually turn out to be a bunch of work like i know our ensembles were maybe worth one credit at Rutgers, and yet they were like three hours a couple times a week and then you know if the music was difficult then you have to put that practice time in and um, I know a lot of my classmates often push their practice time to, you know, the end of the day for like a lot of hours. I cannot do that, unfortunately. So I would have to find, you know, clever ways to fit my practice in throughout the day. Maybe it was between a class, um, you know, like a lo longer chunk of time between classes. Um, so I have to get good at sort of juggling and prioritizing and balancing. So even if you can't really devote as much time as you want to to one thing, that's okay as long as you can put some quality into that small time. So yeah, so many credits. And if you like, you know, add other things, I tried to fit in a few small electives and often it was really hard just because of the sheer amount of requirements that there are in a music major. So that gets tough but it is manageable. I mean, we're all here. So, you know, you can find a way to make it work. Yeah, time management is super key, super key, because every day is gonna be pretty busy. And as Steven said, finding that time to sort of meditate, to sort of reflect is really important because one of the things that we talk about a lot amongst music educator friends is how do you avoid burnout? So those skills translate well beyond to the end of your degree. Um, those are useful skills that you use for the rest of your career. So just finding out how to balance everything is um, something that you're definitely going to have to work on and practice, but um, it's all worth it in the end. Um, as Christina said, we're all here. Um, so it's, it's, it's important uh, and it's worth it, I think. Uh, since we're kind of diving into how hectic and busy the music major life is, how do you personally balance classwork, practicing, and having a college experience without um, burning out, as someone said, or uh, letting the academic part of it or the performance aspect of it slide? Uh, Google Calendar is your best friend. Uh, <laughs> put everything in Google Calendar. It's just really helpful to have like your schedule laid out so you can see it and uh, it helps keep you accountable because if you don't write things down, you just sort of go off the cuff. You can sort of cut corners and, you know, make excuses to avoid doing something now. 
but um, just establishing that routine and establishing like a schedule that you can really, for the most part, adhere to, that can really help um, keep you on track um, throughout the school year. Uh, that's one thing that's helped me. Yeah, that routine is very important. Um, and I, you know, I do, I do just a notes file rather than Google Calendar. Um, because I can just like quickly change things if, if my schedule changes in some way. Um, but for the first time in my junior year, I didn't have 12 hour blocks and I, I didn't have 8 a.m. every day. I still had a 745 <laughs> for two of the days of the week. But um, so I started deciding to do the gym. And, you know, speaking of that college experience for a lot of students, it's like going to the gym and, and going to like farmer's markets and like actually, actually being with friends. Um, so for me, I've always had to schedule in like, Hey, I have this 35 minute lunch break. And like, this is when I'm going to eat breakfast. This is when I'm, I'm going to take like a meditation break. Um, I actually last year had to be, had to like have two friends that were my accountability buddies that would wake me up, not wake me up, but like, I knew if I didn't go to the gym with them at 7:30 in the morning, I was I was letting them down. Um, and that came from that came from the drum corps side of me because like I never woke up once late in drum corps because I had other people counting on me. But I would skip the gym all the time in the morning or my 8 a.m. all the time because it it was just on me if I didn't go. Um, and then really just like uh, you know if if you've had my experience, you have, you know, you work all the way through the week and then you finally get to the weekend, but Saturday is game day. So you have to do marching band all day. And then your Sunday is spent like laundry and essays and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, really, I think the best advice I can give for getting that college experience. And actually this definitely helps with how you do in college is finding time to spend with friends, you know, even if, even if you have to go even harder during the day so that you can go out with your friends at night to the movie or like maybe it's a party, whatever, um, that, that was always really important to me. And the more I started doing that as my college career went on, the better I started feeling mentally and just the more efficient I was during the school day. It, you know, it, it's all about your social connections if you're a social person you know i feel like you guys were both way more organized than me <laughs> but yeah I, I think in retrospect if you have a calendar some place to organize your day and your assignments especially um please do that i can speak a little bit more to practicing i, I suppose I know I mentioned a little bit earlier that I'm just not the type of person who can practice like at 9 p.m. until like 1 a.m. I had some friends who did that and it's amazing. But if you can find the time of day where you do have free time and you do have a, you know, a sizable chunk of it, uh, figure out where you're the most productive because then you're going to get the best practicing in. Um, and that can also go for, you know, doing your work. If you have bigger projects, you know, essays or homework assignments, find those times of productivity because then you're really going to make the most of that and then you know carry that with you every semester when you have something new so that's, that's my two cents that's your two cents um i mean we've we've kind of touched on a lot of the the difficult aspects in terms of time management and balancing things out are there any things that you would consider the most difficult aspect of being a mu music major and how did you handle that particular thing. I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but really the time management thing is like the hardest thing for me. And we've, we've talked about how to overcome it, but um, I guess another thing is, this is, I, I don't know, I don't want to say it's unique to me, but it's something that I've definitely experienced just coming from being a performance major into being a full-time ed major, just being able to interact with the performance aspect of music in the same way has been very difficult for me because as a performance major it was just all about you know you practice like you go out and see music like your all your classes are performance based and i was at a jazz school so 
all the classes started at like 10 a.m. because they expected you to go out at night and like gig or go watch the late sesh at wherever. So going into the ed was a little bit of a shell shock for me and just um, sort of finding the time to put in the practice or to play with people, um, to play in ensembles, to go out and see a concert has been a little bit difficult for me, but that sort of also falls under the time management category. So, yeah. For me, it was practicing. Um, I never, like going, going into college, um, lessons for me, you know, because they're expensive, they were always like, oh, I have solo ensemble or all state coming up. Let me get some lessons real quick. Um, I only started taking regular lessons when I was told by a college professor that I wasn't going to get in anywhere because I had too many bad habits. <laughs> um, so I was like, all right, I'm going bankrupt for these lessons. Um, and it worked out. Uh, but I had never, I wasn't used to spending hours in the practice room. Um, I, I never did. <laughs> I just, I was only in a practice room if I were rehearsing with someone. Um, so for me, my freshman year, I, the way I got around that was I started a hundred days of practice on my Instagram. Um, and not only did it motivate me to practice every day, but it also motivated a lot of my peers. I was having a whole bunch of people tell me like, Oh my God, Steven, seeing your videos are making like that makes me practice more and that motivates me to work harder. Um, and I actually develop like people that I've now marched with at crown and strike have, have been like, Oh yeah, I knew you from that hundred days of practice series you did in freshman year. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. You watched all that. <laughs> um, that was the best way. And I I've actually recommended it to a lot of people and it's helped them as well. Um, but practice yeah practicing for me i it's not that i don't like my instrument i i love it um but when i'm you know dr hayward you know because we met through indoor like when i'm spending my weekends rehearsing with an outside ensemble and then when i'm during the week i have to prep for auditions for drum corps like i the amount of time that i actually devote to my lessons is is very minimal and that's when, that's when I can get a practice room because I have to sign out percussion practice rooms and I never know what my schedule is going to be that week. Um, you know, it, on top of our 18 credits, that's more like 25. Music ed majors are also teaching, right? So add a second marching band credit to me. Um, and then we're also doing outside ensembles. So add a third marching band credit to me. And that's a lot of time that's going away from our practicing. So there have been weeks where I practice like two hours where like the performance majors, you know, Lewis can attest like performance majors are out there for like six, seven hours a day um, at times. And that I was lucky if I got seven hours a week. So that's, that's definitely big for me. Yes, definitely. I'm in agreement with both of those points um, towards I would say the end of, well, that's not true because I, by the time I was a sophomore, I think I was taking about 23 credits a semester and I was front loading. And then later I added my minor. So of course that was self-inflicted, but it was really just figuring out how to, you know, compartmentalize sometimes. By the time I got to my first semester, of senior year yeah I was preparing for a recital so it was fall senior year um, I was part-time student teaching because they changed the requirements in New Jersey so now we have to do it part of the time in the fall semester and then full-time in the spring I was finishing up requirements like an odd assortment of things so I felt like I was just getting mm, pressure from myself of course but even from some teachers I felt like they had a lot of high expectations for me as I was graduating to just perform really well in every aspect so it was just figuring out how to be okay with maybe not being 
at the highest level in everything you do, sometimes you have to sacrifice your own desires in some ways to just be like, okay, this is the best I could do considering the circumstances, considering how many other things I had to do and just be happy with that. Yes, that is, that is so big. That is such a big comment. Uh, this year I had to honestly be real with myself and be like, how am I supposed to teach, do two outside ensembles, be a president of a club? And I was trying to be drumline captain. And I finally, like, I was like, okay, or I was told, don't be, um, don't try and be a jack of all trades and master of none. And that, that meant I, I, at the time I was like, that's not what I'm trying to do, but it ended up being, you know, if I want to, if I want to preserve myself, I need to not go for drumline captain and I need to maybe not take two jobs and only take one, you know, and um, that's, that's huge. Yeah. And we, we've kind of uh, bounced around it with some of the questions that were asked, but I, I think personally kind of looking at a lot of music majors, the, the most difficult aspect of them, especially ones that haven't had any kind of private lesson instruction beforehand is picking apart every aspect of their playing, whether you're an education major or performance major, uh, because it's mentally taxing. Uh, so I like to kind of give the tip that you, when, when you're thinking about your own playing, you need to look at it uh, and evaluate it into the third person and take some of that emotional reactivity away from it. So that you can kind of think of your playing as if you were investigating it with a scientist. And then, especially as an educator, if you're able to give yourself solutions to fix your problems, then you're going to be even better to fix your students' problems. So kind of getting into the next topic point, um, and we, we did do a whole series, a whole session on kind of applying to music school, um, but kind of now that we're, we have these different schools with our panelists, what was your application process for music school like? <laughs> the mutes, the dance of the mute buttons. <laughs> uh, so it was, uh, for the performance aspect, obviously it was, it was more centered towards playing. So it was a lot of video submission. And um, for some of those, it was like, a preliminary audition and then you'd get a call back. Um, some it was just a one and done. You just send in the video and then you get your um, your response. Um, there's also essays attached to that as with most schools you're going to apply to. Um, but the weight was definitely on the performative aspect of your application. And um, with most applications I feel like um, life experience is the most important thing. And um, Going into a music ed degree, it's not necessarily required, but I think it's good to have like a little bit of teaching experience, like maybe you've given a private lesson here or there, maybe you've, you help out with your high school marching band over the summer before you go to college. So just little experiences like that can sort of, um, sort of set you apart from other applicants, maybe. Yes, so I think it might depend on the kind of school that you're applying to. Um, most of the schools that I applied to, if not all of them, were part of some larger uh, university where you could pretty much study anything. So I think that there was a weight given to obviously your academic credentials, all of those other experiences that come with the generic college application. But then, you know, of course, I did audition to all of my schools. So that was definitely the biggest source of anxiety in some ways is just making sure that you can check off all those boxes that you've prepared a solid audition and then um, at the site you just play they listen to you and that's pretty much it it's not super complicated even if it is really nerve-wracking so that was it wasn't too complicated overall yeah um just like we have double the amount of credits, we also have double the amount of work when we're auditioning. Uh, so like second semester, senior year, 
you have the prelim the the like regular application for the school every school you apply to a scholarship application for every school uh, sorry um your music audition and application for every school you apply to which comes with flights oftentimes that you have to buy um then you have you know every school has different scholarship applications so you end up doing like six different applications per school um and a few more than than all of your all of your buddies are doing um so that was that was a lot to or get organized um you know because you're like oh you know it's it's march 2nd that date sounds familiar what was due today and it ends up being like this huge financial aid application um i ran into that twice <laughs> um and then you know a big thing for me was was staying relaxed during auditions um i ended up going to university of miami but that was actually like i i didn't think i i would ever end up here because it costs so much um so i i used that audition as like a practice audition i was like no way i could afford this and it was my best audition because I thought of it as a practice audition. Um, in college, we learn about doing mock auditions and everything. That was never talked about in high school. Um, I had never done something like that before. I'd done Allstate. Um, uh, but I really, I needed that mindset of, you know, this is just a practice. I don't really want to go here kind of thing, um, even though I'm very happy here. Um, because the one school I was really looking to get into, which was Florida State, um, I was so nervous to play for those professors that I, I played like a middle schooler who had just picked up six for the first time. Like I was shaking. I couldn't get through my music. Um, I cried that day. <laughs> and, um, you know, that was, I put all that pressure on myself. Right. And I'm sure Christina and Lewis, you know, they're shaking their heads right now. They might have had an experience similar. Um, the best part of that, that day was I got an Oreo when I left the audition. <laughs> um, the, the TAs there who, who were scrolling Facebook the entire time um, I played just, you know, had some Oreos for those who just did not make it. Um, but really, uh, if I were to give it any advice to anyone, it's to do as many mock auditions as possible with people and just think of each audition as another mock audition. You know, if you don't go in there putting the pressure on yourself, you're going to do fine. Absolutely. And um, this is sort of unique to when you go to grad school, but there's another layer, which is like an interview, a formal interview. Uh, so it's just for people who are curious when you apply to graduate school. Um, if they if you send in your application and they like what they see they'll ask you to come in usually for an in-person interview although for cu i was luckily able to um do like a skype interview so that was one less plane ticket i had to buy but um it's just another thing to consider and it's the same thing with auditions an interview is just another audition doing many 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 mock interviews and just sort of fleshing out what you're going to say um beforehand can be super helpful so just putting in the time beforehand to make sure that you're ready to go when the real thing comes up. And what Steven said is really true. Just be trying to be relaxed. Don't think about it too much. Just go in and be yourself. And um, that's how you do. That's how you're going to do your best. And you know, I, have, I had an interview for undergrad as well. Um, so I think it's a relatively common thing for music education. And uh, just briefly talking about like the audition experience and prep again, um, even if you don't have access to private lessons, there are a lot of free resources. I would suggest playing for your friends, family and band director as much as possible and trying to get feedback. Another really great tool is to record yourself. And then that's very obvious that you are doing something right or wrong and compare it to what you think that piece should sound like uh, rhythmically and stylistically. Um, kind of going on to the advice portion of the questions. So parents, some parents don't approve of their child majoring in music. Do you have any advice? 
for talking with parents who don't approve of majoring in music? I was pretty fortunate. My parents were not in that boat, which I know that, you know, a lot of people aren't. Um, I hesitate to advise this only because I know that this is not something that is necessarily manageable for everyone, but you can kind of use the bargaining chip of, oh, maybe I'll double major. <laughs> and then, you know, that other major you can kind of put to the side later on. Um, but that being said, if you can double major, and I know this is a question that we might encounter later, it is not something I would discourage just because it's really good if you can to, you know, help yourself be a little bit more well-rounded. Now, if that's not feasible whatsoever, I think that it's, it's hard to say because every parent is different, but if you can find a way to just convey to them how sincerely passionate you are and how willing you are to work, there's a lot of different avenues that are possible in music. I think that many people think of music as being, you're a teacher, and I think teaching is actually, you know, compared to some of the other careers in music, it's much more stable, but people have that idea that it is just teaching or it is being, you know, this uh, performer, which is really hard. You often have to juggle a lot of jobs when you're just out there performing. Um, but nowadays with advancing technologies and all that stuff, you can find a way to kind of maneuver into other fields with that musical experience and be able to, you know, have a steady living. So it's not impossible with a little bit of creativity. Yeah, I'm, I'm also fortunate to have had supportive parents. Um, my grandma, when she was still alive, was would question me every every time I brought up me doing music she was like are you sure you want to be homeless <laughs> um and I've had you know when I've had to do my gen eds I've had science teachers really say like well what's your backup plan like why would you why would you do that um I think the most convincing thing I've ever said to my parents was I don't see myself doing anything else um and I, I know a lot of my friends who've had that situation have made deals with their parents. They've said, give me a semester. If I can do that semester and I know I love it, then please let me do it. Because why would I, why would I spend my life making more money and be miserable? Do you want, do you really want your child to be miserable? <laughs> um, or, you know, can you please at, le at least let me try this out for a semester? Um, if I don't like it, you know, I, I don't know, I'll pay you back within 20 years. <laughs> um, but you can also, like Christina brought up a great point. There are so many avenues of music and so many options out there for what you can do with a music degree. Um, and so many that actually make a ton of money, you know, with that music degree, you can go and be, you know, administration for one of these big orchestras. They they live in the nicest apartments and they make uh, probably three years of what my teaching salary is going to be in one year. And they they love it because they still get to work with musicians and and oftentimes they still get to be part of the education side of it if they if they run like um, you know, I've talked to people from uh, different um like educational companies or the education wing of uh, this orchestra or that, that, you know, organization, whatever, whatever it is. Um, you can also, if, if you talk to someone at the university you want to go to uh, like a professor and just say, Hey, my parents really don't think I should be doing this. It, say it's financial and have them like pick out their most successful friend and show your parents what, you know, what they're able to do. Uh, oftentimes it's just because our view of what music can be, like Christina said, is just so limited to teacher because they couldn't do it or musician <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, and uh, Steven sort of touched on this, but like all these different musical avenues, they're not discrete disciplines, right? they all intersect 
So you don't necessarily, if you become like an audio engineer, it doesn't mean you don't, you have to stop playing forever. Like you can, you can sort of weave your way through your career and sort of, sort of um, craft, craft your own path to put it to, to just to be very cliche, craft your own path. Um, there's a lot of options uh, there. As he said, it's not just teaching, it's not just performing. And um, you can sort of combine a bunch of different aspects from a different bunch of different fields and sort of find your own way. So um, since everything for the last couple of months have been online, uh, kind of the question is, how have you dealt with the transition, uh, musically speaking, as everything has gone to Zoom, Google Classroom, and the such? Um, and to give the panelists some time to talk, I guess I, I'll start. Um, I actually, I've actually enjoyed the transition a little bit. Uh, it allows me to keep the majority of my students engaged more. Uh, I mean, I have students ranging from the youngest student I have is in third grade and then up to college students. So it's a, it's a wide gamut of experience and interest. And one way that I found to keep kids engaged, especially at the, the lower levels, is um, that I have to provide practice recordings for them to play with. Because obviously with the online life, it's, it's very hard for you to play with your students. And as a teacher, you have to accept the fact that uh, it's really great for you to play with them, even though they're, in your mind, they're not playing with you. Uh, but when the sound comes out of their computer and they get to play with their teacher again, um, it's, it's kind of like what it was. And then if you happen to be able to record uh, some of the things that they're working on, they can play with you all week and come more prepared to their next lesson. So that's just one of the little tips that I've been doing to try to keep my students engaged uh, and open it up and see how everyone else has dealt with uh, COVID life. Um, since I don't see any mute buttons going away, <laughs> um, as a percussionist, this has been quite hard. Uh, yesterday, for the first time in five months, I went to my university and played on the instruments. I, I finally felt uh, ready to go do that. I felt that my studio was uh, taking the proper precautions to make that a safe space for those going. Um, and my parents were finally okay with me doing it as well. Um, it was the first time I heard actual sound coming out of an instrument in five months. And that was, that was uh, soul healing for me because I've been on a rubber and wood practice pad for all those five months now. And, you know, not even mentioning the chops, like my, my mind has just, uh, my ears have gone asleep and my mind is now not used to uh, intervals as much. And it's, it's lost any creativity or any memory of pieces and um, it, it really took a toll on, on my musical well-being. Um, so I, I just spent like four hours, just like no goals, just play and listen, uh, which was amazing. Um, I found as a teacher though, obviously it, it's, it's kind of hard when you're talking up here and you, you're like a Peloton trainer, just like you know, running exercise, like, all right, guys, and now the left, and everyone's playing with you, and you hear nothing other than yourself. <laughs> um, you're, like, screaming at this computer, and you can't tell if, if kids are getting it, and you can't tell, you know, if they understand the material or how you can't diagnose their playing at all um, because they can't play with you. What I've found is great about that, though, is that you can't hear their mistakes. And for them, um, you know, while I explain a concept, they can be trying it themselves without disrupting the whole class, right? Uh, so I was giving a small master class about grace notes the other day, you know, how to do flams and, and drags and a whole bunch of drum stuff. Um, and I was noticing as I was explaining new concepts, students were working on what we just talked about and what they were still having trouble with. They were just working on that while listening. 
Um, or, you know, if, if uh, they don't right away, if, if they understand that already, they can start practicing what they, what they haven't gotten yet so that, um, you know, they get the most out of the time you're spending with them without being judged by everyone else. I, I found that that's been the best thing for them. Um, still, I would not trade in-person interaction for this. No way. <laughs> I would definitely agree with what Stephen was talking about. And I, in that regard, I don't have the same excuse because I do have my instruments at home. <laughs> but there is sort of a sense of uh, the motivation in some ways has been lost, having, you know, all this time at home and being stuck in a certain way. Um, they had warned me in my last semester that when you are a music education major, your priorities for practicing are gonna shift. And I was like really trying to resist that, but then it ended up happening, which made me kind of mad at myself. And even now I'm just trying to plan different aspects of the future and somehow practicing goes in the back seat and <laughs> it should not, it should never go in the back seat if you know you can organize your life in that way. Um, so finding that motivation is still a work in progress, but there were some positive aspects to going online for my student teaching period because it was really interesting to be able to experiment with a lot of these learning technologies. A lot of them are really useful and you can implement them for your classes even if you know, you're know you not online when we do return, hopefully not in the too far future, when we return to in-person uh, school, then you know there are a lot of these resources that you can hang on to. And I really enjoyed being able to make things from scratch for my kids um, and see them react to it and then be able to make changes in real time so that they can use uh, updated versions of the educational tools that I was making for them. So that was really exciting. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a really good challenge. Um, I, have, I won't say it's been easy, but um, as a teacher, you're going to encounter many, 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 many obstacles. And uh, whatever you plan, like it's something else is going to happen. There's going to be many surprises. So just being able to develop the skill of adapting lessons, thinking on your feet, sort of overcoming these challenges as they come at you has been really useful for me in my teaching. So yeah, in that sense, it's been, it's been kind of helpful, but um, it's definitely been difficult. I won't say it's been easy. As both a teacher and a student, it's been very difficult. Christina was mentioning motivation, and that's also been a really big issue for me. So just, um, even more important to find like time for yourself to reflect and go outside and you know change up the venue now and then like sitting at your desk all day like you do it enough as a student and then just to do it in class also can be pretty taxing so you know just sort of finding different ways to sort of trick yourself into into thinking it's different or doing something a little bit differently to keep you more engaged can be really helpful so uh, let's get into the last two questions of the evening. Yay! <laughs> uh, first one, do you remember, and can you tell a story about the moment you wanted to be a music major? I, I have a story, <laughs> and it actually is a moment, which is pretty cool. Um, and this was like the first, my first year of high school so I was a freshman and I was at a concert and that was the time that I was sort of ruminating over whether I even wanted to continue with the band in high school just because I was feeling not satisfied unfortunately sometimes it happens um, and so I was deliberating over whether I would stick with it and we had the concert and I was able to see these older kids who were playing at a really high level. And it was so inspiring just to see the potential of music and you know the potential that I could have if I really 
stuck with it and worked hard and set goals. So that was essentially the catalyst for getting back into private lessons. And then from there, I think the passion and the excitement it multiplied. And then eventually I was like, yes, I'm going to study music. It wasn't necessarily a moment for me, but um, looking back, there was a moment that stands out to me as a, as a particularly powerful musical experience. And um, so it was just like a end of the year band concert and we've been working really hard on this piece and we played it for our concert. It was the last piece in the, in the program. And uh, after the cutoff, my band director just like went, yes. And like gave us this biggest smile ever. And it's just, it felt really good to work at something so hard and then to accomplish that goal and to do it amongst all your peers and all your friends. So it was like a shared experience almost. And that was um, super fulfilling and really powerful. And that sort of was one of the moments that drove me to where I am today. And I can always think on think back on that moment fondly. Um, and when I sort of am looking for motivation, I can look back at that moment. But um, in terms of becoming a teacher, uh, there isn't really a specific moment. It's more of like a gradual progression, an amalgamation of a lot of different life events. Um, yeah, I wish I had a moment like, like Christina, like I wish I had, I had one single moment. I do have a moment, but it was, um, it was what made me want to do percussion. Um, kind of like Christina, but dropped down a few grades. I was in like, uh, I guess fourth or fifth grade and the middle schoolers played for us. Um, and they played like SpongeBob or something. And I was watching the percussionist the whole time because they had like so many auxiliary instruments. I was like, all the other kids are just playing one instrument. And there's this like idiot in the back <laughs> with like 20 instruments. And I love that. And then um, one kid at the end of the piece, like did, um, or, or I guess he was demonstrating percussion and he did like a little snare drum solo. And then he did this thing where he like flipped the stick up in the air. And uh, instead of catching it, it hit the acoustic tiles in the back and just fell. And I thought, for, like, everyone else laughed. And I was like, oh, that's great. I want to be him. <laughs> um, that person ended up being, him and his two brothers, who both played percussion at some point, um, ended up being most the most instrumental people to me in uh, how I got through, how, why I chose to continue music. They were the ones who... Uh, first brought me to, you know, DCI live in the theaters, um, brought me to my first indoor audition and my first indoor show. And uh, they were constantly drumming. Like I would go in at 745 in the morning and uh, this senior would just drum with me as a ninth grader or an eighth grade, you know, and, and ninth grader. Um, and like, you just spend like 30 minutes in the morning drumming with me and teaching me, even though he had no responsibility to do that. All of his friends were having fun and he was just there trying to help me get better. Um, so I think that I wanted to, I wanted it to be him for other kids. And that ended up being why I tried so hard in music throughout high school and tried so hard to uh, help everyone else. And that helping everyone else is what ended up being me wanting to be a music major. And a uh, final question, any advice for incoming freshman music majors and any, any kind of like final words? I think the most important thing you can do is just find a community and find a support system that can help you along. Because as we've said, it's not the easiest degree. You're going to be really busy. You'll have a lot of stuff to do, but just having a support system that you can fall back on and that you can reach out to um, is super, super helpful and very important for your mental health and for just um, being successful in what you want to do. So finding those friends, finding those professors that you can talk to, utilizing any mental health resources that are on campus, talking, 
to your family if you feel comfortable doing so. Just knowing that you're not alone, you know, that really helps. Um, this tip is something that I have not utilized enough, um, but I have started to, especially with COVID. Um, whether it's uh, helping with sleep or helping with stress or focus or uh, performance mindset or anxiety, anger, whatever, the app Headspace is nine nine is is zero dollars and ninety nine cents for students. I just found out about that. And as a music ed major, like whether you have uh, any mental health issues, like stress is real for everybody. <laughs> um, and whether or not you understand it's anxiety, you know, it. there are some great meditation things in here. Uh, we use it all summer for focus at, at Crown and um, it's, it's honestly wonderful. So 99 cents headspace. So I guess this kind of relates to what both guys were talking about, but just take the time to get to know yourself a little bit better and figure out, um, I suppose, where you feel the most anxious, what kinds of things stress you out, and then take those steps to kind of combat that. So if you know for example, that you know you're getting really overwhelmed by all of the classes or the practicing, then you know carve out some time in your day just for yourself. Um, similarly, but kind of on an unrelated note, this is all about managing your work. It's really important that if you can figure out what your best routine and structure is earlier on in college, then it's just going to help you the rest of the way through. So really making sure that you can figure out okay, I'm the most productive at this time of the day, and then really just kind of sticking with that, um, it's gonna help you in the long run. So the earlier that you can figure that kind of stuff out about yourself, then you know, you'll know you just be in good shape for the rest of the way. Yeah, that goes for organization and note-taking too. Like, if you can find out that you take paper notes versus like notability on your iPad or um, what is it, like Evernote, uh, whatever, you know, if you can figure that out right away, you'll be better off for organizing things later because me, every semester, I was like, oh, I'm going to take paper today and now I'm going to use my laptop on this semester. <laughs> my, I, I can't go and find half of those notes now. <laughs> so. Well, excellent. Uh, panelists, if you could stick around for a little bit. Uh, I want to thank Christina, Lewis, and Stephen for joining me in this open discussion tonight. Thank you for everyone that is uh, joining us via Zoom and Facebook. Uh, tomorrow we have a session uh, starting your first composition at 3 p.m. and we have one on Thursday, uh, intermediate flute repertoire. Uh, so thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.